I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, But in there somewhere and all that is a a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Well, welcome to the Leaves of Glen Mansion, uh, where I read to you the hottest public domain books and short stories. This week, we're continuing to read uh, Chapter 18 of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. It's his eighth novel, uh, which he published in 1850, and is widely considered his most popular work. He's born the 7th of February, 1812, uh, and he died the 9th of June, 1870. Do you want to hear more fun facts? About Charles Dickens? Turns out, uh, the dick part of Dickens was more apt than anyone ever realized. Uh, He resented having a large family. Although Dickens seemed to have healed from his breakup with his first love, uh, Maria Biednell, everyone, all the characters in his books had bizarre last names, and even the real people that he was actually involved with had weird last names. His marriage to Catherine well, it was not a happy one. He, he blamed Catherine for not being a good mother and uh, wife. Dickens was not pleased with the fact that he had so many uh, children to support. They had ten children. Apparently, according to Dickens, this was Catherine's fault. So, just sit back for a moment and let the logic that can take a person to that conclusion, just wash over you and try to figure out how you can connect your own dots. I can't. He found Catherine to be dull and boring. Then why marry her? At one point, Dickens said that Catherine was not his equal intellectually. So, these are more reasons to dislike this man. Uh, The one thing this couple had in common was that they both came from large families. Dickens had eight siblings, while Catherine had ten siblings. So, he came from a large family, she came from a large family, they have their own large family, and then he just suddenly blames her. Uh, Let's recap the previous chapter. Mr. Dick starts showing up to check on David, and the whole school falls in love with this uh, lovable uh, weirdo. Mr. Duck, uh, Mr. Mr. Dick talks about how some uh, guy keeps showing up to harass Miss Betsy and get money. Uh, Uriah Heep is uh, constantly annoying with his whole I'm so humble thing, and that's drilled into us. Uh, then he passive-aggressively gets David to go have tea with him and his mom, where they drill him on all the gossip they can get out of him. Uh, he gets all swept up in it, then he resents it. Uh, Mr. McWeber just suddenly walks by and shows up, because he's a jerk, just walks into the house, and uh, just invites himself to sit down and hang out and talk to David. And then David is embarrassed of this whole thing, so then David scooches him out, and goes back to Mick Weber's house. Uh, it turns out he lives in a hotel. Him and his wife, uh, they're back in town in London. And they're just sort of hanging out. And uh, racking up the bill at the hotel that they cannot pay. So they eventually have to sneak off. Uh, before Mr. Mick Weber becomes best friends with Uriah Heep. And probably telling Uriah all sorts of horrible things about David. Who knows? Uh, and then uh, they take off. They scooch out of town because they can't pay their bill. And so David thinks fondly of them but he's happy that they're gone. Damn it. They said all that too fast. Now he had a lot of time left before the uh, grandfather clock goes off, which is knowing my timer to make me stop babbling. Uh, What can I possibly talk about? Well, we already uh, know I'm unemployed, and uh, we don't have to hear about that again, so unemployment leads to what? Uh, That free time. Free time leads to what? Uh, Oh, I decided to promote the show a little more since I barely did it all before. Uh, So uh, I got on Twitter and uh, looked at one friend of mine who just posts a ton but he doesn't really post anything uh, interesting. But it is a flood. I mean, this guy posts 50, 60, 70 times a day. It's ridiculous. And so I look at his number count and he's actually got a ton of followers. And I said, okay, well, trick number one, you have to post a ton to get in people's faces, I guess, to get anyone to even look at your junk. 
And so I did uh, post a lot and nothing happened. And then finally, uh, one Twitter user, right when I was about to give up, said, don't give up. Uh, Here, I'll introduce you to some people. Now I'm part of this Twitter atmosphere, this Twitter family. Uh, So that's been a little bit better. I've been listening to a lot of new shows and stuff and chatting amongst each other. So that's been pretty good. Thank God for the grandfather clock because none of that was interesting. Well, with that, let's dive into the next chapter. Chapter 18. Uh, uh, a retrospect. My school days, exclamation point, the silent gliding on of my existence. The unseen, unfelt progress of my life. From childhood up to youth, exclamation point. Uh, let me think as I look back upon that flowing water. Now a, uh, ooh, a dry channel overgrown with leaves. Well, that got real sad real fast. Uh, whether there are any marks along its course by which I can remember how it ran. A moment, and I occupy my place in the cathedral, where we all went together, every Sunday morning assembling first at school for that purpose. Uh, The earthly smell, the sunless air, the sensation of the world being shut out, the resounding of the organ through the black and white arched galleries and aisles, our wings, uh, they take me back! And hold me, hovering above those days. This is getting really abstract. In a half-sleeping and half-waking dream. Yeah. I am not the last boy in the school. I have risen in a few months over several heads. But uh, the first boy seems to be a a mighty creature. Ooh, dwelling far off. uh, Whose giddy height is unattainable. Agnes says, no. Uh, But I say, yes. And tell her that she little thinks what stores of knowledge have been mastered by the wonderful being. At those place she thinks I, even I, weak aspirant, may arrive in time. He is not my private friend and public patron, as Steerforth was. Oh boy, back to Steerforth. But I hold him in a reverential respect. I chiefly wonder what he'll be when he leaves Dr. Strong's, and what man kind will do to maintain any place against him. But who is this that breaks upon me? This is Miss Shepard, whom I love. Miss Shepard is a boarder at Mrs. Nettingall's uh, establishment. I adore Miss Shepard. She is a little girl uh, in a in a spencer with a round face and curly flaxen hair. Uh, the Mrs. Nettingale's young ladies come to the cathedral, too. I cannot look upon my book, for I must look upon Miss Shepard. When the choristers chaunt, chaunt, I hear Miss Shepard. In the service, I mentally insert Miss Shepard's name. I put her in among the royal family. At home, in my own room, I am sometimes moved to cry out, Oh, ah, Miss Shepard, uh, in a transport of love. That doesn't sound good. If he's by himself, alone in his room, then he cries out, Oh, Miss Shepard, what are you doing to lead you to suddenly cry out, Miss Shepard? We're not going to get into it. Uh, for some time, I am doubtful of Miss Shepard's feelings, but at length, fate being proprietress, we meet at the dancing school. I am Miss Shepard for my partner, <laughs> and I touch Miss Shepard's glove, <laughs> and I feel a thrill go right uh, arm of my jacket and come out at my hair. I say nothing to Miss Shepard. Oh, but we understand each other. Miss Shepard and myself live but to be united. Why do I secretly give Miss Shepard twelve uh, Brazil nuts for a present, I wonder? They are not expressive of affection. They are difficult to pack into a parcel of any regular shape. They are hard to crack, uh, even in room doors. Oh, is that a thing people used to do back then? You didn't have nutcrackers, so you just kept smacking nuts in a room door? And they were, uh, they are oily when cracked, yet I feel that they are appropriate to Miss Shepard. Soft, seedy biscuits also I bestow upon Miss Shepard, and, 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 and oranges innumerable. Once I kissed Miss Shepard uh, in the cloakroom. Uh, ecstasy! Exclamation point. What are my agony and indignation next day when I hear a flying rumor that the Mrs. Nettingal have stood Miss Shepard in the stocks for turning in her toes? 
I don't know what that phrase means. Miss Shepard being the one pervading theme and vision of my life, how do I ever come to break with her? I can't conceive. And yet, a coolness grows between Miss Shepard and myself. Whispers reach me of Miss Shepard having said she wished I wouldn't stare so, and having avowed a, a preference for Master Jones. For Jones! A boy! Of no merit, whatever! The gulf between me and Miss Shepard widens. At last, one day, I meet the Mrs. Nettingale's establishment out walking. Miss Shepard makes a face as she goes by and laughs to her companion. Oh, oh, all is over. The devotion of a life, it seems, a life. It is all the same, is at an end. Miss Shepard comes out of the morning service, and uh, the royal family know her no more. I am higher in the school, and no one breaks my peace. I am not at all polite now to the Mrs. Nettingall's young ladies, and shouldn't dote on any of them if they were twice as many and twenty times as beautiful. I think the dancing school a tiresome affair, and I wonder why the girls can't dance by themselves. And uh, uh, leave us alone. I am growing great in Latin verses, and neglect the laces of my boots. Uh, Dr. Strong refers me in public as a promising young scholar. Dr. Mr. Dick is wild with joy. Oh, and my aunt remits me a, a guinea by the next post. The shade of a, a young butcher rises, like the apparition of a armed head in Macbeth. Who is this young butcher? He is the terror of the youth of Canterbury. There is a, a vague belief abroad that the beef suet which he anoints his hair gives him unnatural strength, and that he's a match for a man. He is a oh, broad-faced, uh, bull-necked young butcher uh, with rough red cheeks and an ill-conditioned mind and an, an injurious tongue. And his main use of this tongue is to disparage Dr. Strong's young gentleman. He says, uh, publicly, that if they want anything, he'll give it them. He names individuals among them, myself included, who he could undertake to settle with one hand, and the other tied behind him. Oh, he waylays the smaller boys to punch their unprotected heads and calls challenges after me in the open streets. What is with, is this like a, so this is a real butcher. So they go to the butcher and the butcher's just harassing the people that are coming to his store. Is that what's really happening here? For these sufficient reasons, I resolve to fight the butcher. Okay. It is a summer evening down in a green hollow. At the corner of a wall, I, I meet the butcher by appointment, and I am attended by a select body of our boys. The butcher by uh, two other butchers. A young pu 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 publican? A young publican. I'm going to look that one up. I wanted to, I, what is a publican? Publican. Oh, publican. Whatever. A person who owns or manages a pub. Okay, whatever. And a sweep. The preliminaries are adjusted, and the butcher and myself stand face to face. In a moment, the butcher lights 10,000 candles out of my left eyebrow. What does that mean? In another moment, I don't know where the wall is, or, or, or where I am, or where anybody is. I hardly know which is myself, and which is the butcher, and we also they become one. And we are always in such a tangle and tussle, knocking about on the trodden grass. Sometimes I see the butcher, uh, bloody but confident. Sometimes, nah, I see nothing, and sit gasping on my second's knee. Sometimes I go in at the butcher madly and cut my knuckles open against his face without appearing to discompose him at all. At last I awake very queer about the head from a, a giddy sleep and see the butcher walking off congratulated by the two other butchers and the, the sweep and publican. And putting on his coat as he goes from which I augur justly uh, that the victory uh, is, is his I'm taken home in a sad plight, and I have beefsteaks put to my eyes, and I am rubbed with vinegar and brandy, and find a, a great puffy place bursting up in my upper lip, uh, which swells moderately. For three or eh, four days I remain at home, and uh, a very ill-looking subject with a green shade over my eyes. And I should be very dull, but that Agnes uh, is a sister to me, and condoles with me, and reads to me, and makes the time light and happy. Agnes has my confidence completely, always. I tell her all about the butcher and the wrongs he has heaped upon me, and she thinks I couldn't have done otherwise than fight the butcher, while she shrinks and trembles at my having fought him. 
Time is stolen on unobserved, for Adams is not the head boy in these days that are come now, nor has he been this many and many a day. Adams has left the school so long that when he comes back on a visit to Dr. Strong, there are not as many there, besides myself, who know him. Adams is going to be called to the bar almost directly, and uh, is to be an advocate, and uh, to wear a, a wig. I'm surprised to find him a meeker man than I had thought, and less imposing in appearance. He has not staggered the world yet, either, for it goes on, as well as I can make out, pretty much the same as if he had eh, never joined it. A blank uh, through which the warriors of poetry and history march on in stately hosts that seem to have no end, and uh, what comes next? I... Am the head boy now, exclamation point. I look down on the line of boys below me with a condescending interest in such of them as to bring to my mind the boy I was myself. When I first came there, uh, the little fellow seems to be no part of me. I remember him, something left behind upon the road of life as something I have passed rather than have actually been. And almost think of him eh, as some, uh, someone else. And the little girl I saw on that first day at Mr. Wickfield's, uh, where is she? Gone also, in her stead, the perfect likeness of the picture. A child likeness no more. Moves about the house, and Agnes, my sweet sister, as I call her in my thoughts, my counselor and my friend, the better angel of the lives of all who have come within her calm, good, self-denying influence, is quite a woman. Ooh, well, on that note, why don't we, uh, Hey, why don't you and I go scooch on up into the master bedroom, huh? Let's go have some good times as I read to you the latest upcoming romance novels from Penguin Random House Books. Ah, there you are. You look gorgeous. But I don't like what you're wearing. Uh, instead, why don't you put on this fashionable but non-threatening hoodie, uh, a pair of Yeezys, and a Torah. Aha, you'll see where this is going in a minute. As I read to you about the new upcoming romance novel, The Intimacy Experiment by Rosie Dannon. Uh, about the intimacy experiment? Sure, let's learn about it. Naomi and Ethan will test the boundaries of love in this provocative romance from the author of the groundbreaking debut... The roommate, burp, Naomi Grant, has built her life around going against the grain. After sex-positive startup she co-founded becomes an international sensation, Ah, she wants to extend her educational platform to live lecturing. Unfortunately, despite her long list of qualifications, higher ed won't hire her. Ethan Cohen, I mean, the director, like Joel and Ethan Cohen, has recently received two honors. L.A. Mag nominated him as one of the city's hottest bachelors and became a rabbi of his own synagogue. Low on both funds and congregants, the executive board of Ethan's new shul uh, hired him with the hopes that his non-traditional background will attract more millennials to the faith. They've given him three months to turn things around or else they'll close the doors of his synagogue for good. Oh, they hired him because he's hot. Get those... Get all those kids in there. Naomi and Ethan join forces to host a buzzy seminar series <laughs> on modern intimacy. The perfect solution to their problems until they discover a new one. Their growing attraction to each other. They built the syllabus <laughs> for love's latest experiment. But neither of them expected they'd be the ones putting it to the test. Well, that's bizarre. Uh, the cover is uh, very glowy, and it has a man and a woman sitting next to a podium, and they both look like Sims characters from the game The Sims. Uh, so, The Intimacy Experiment by Rosie Dannon it comes out April 6th. It's 16 bucks. So go to Penguin Random House and, uh, and order that if you like things to be real, real complicated. Well, with that, uh, it's not horny anymore. Let's go back to the story. Well, let's 
get back in the story, why don't you settle yourself in in the chair there, here, in the library, where I do my reading, because I love this bit, and I'm never going to give up the whole fake mansion thing. Uh, you settled? Oh, wait. Okay, you settled? Okay, good. What other changes have come upon me besides the changes in my, uh, my growth and looks? And in the knowledge I have garnered all this while, I, sw- I wear a gold watch and chain, a ring upon my little finger, what? and a long-tailed coat, and I use a, a great deal of bear's grease, which, taken in conjunction with the ring, eh, looks bad. I am I in love again? I am. I worship the eldest Miss Larkins. The eldest Miss Larkins is not a, a little girl. She, she's tall, uh, dark, and black-eyed. A fine figure of a woman. <laughs> the, the eldest Miss Larkins is uh, not a chicken. Uh, for the youngest Miss Larkins is not that. And the eldest must be three or four years older. Perhaps the eldest Miss Larkins may be uh, about 30. Yeah, my passion for her is beyond all bounds. The eldest Miss Larkin knows officers. It's an awful thing to bear. I, I see them speaking to her in the street. Oh, I see them cross the way to meet her. Yeah, when her, when her bonnet, she has a, a bright taste of bonnets, is seen coming down the pavement, accompanied by her sister's bonnet. Oh, she laughs and talks and, and seems to like it. I spend a, a good deal of my own spare time in, in walking up and down to meet her. If I can bow to her once in the day, uh, I, I know her to bow too. Knowing Miss Larkins, I am happier. I deserve a bow now and then. Uh, the raging agonies I suffer on the night of the race ball, where I know the eldest Miss Larkins will be dancing with the military, I ought to have some compensation if there would be even-handed justice in the world. My, my passion takes away my appetite. It makes me wear my newest silk neckerchief continually. Why? Is your neck too skinny now? You're trying to hide it? I don't understand. I have no relief but in putting on my best clothes and having my boots cleaned over and over again. I seem then to be worthier of the eldest Miss Larkins. Everything that belongs to her or is connected with her is precious to me. Miss Larkins... Uh, Oh, Mr. Larkins, a gruff old gentleman with a uh, uh, double chin, and one of his uh, eyes immovable in his head, is fraught with the interest to me. When I can't meet his daughter, I go where I am likely to meet him. This is obsessive and creepy. To say, uh, how do you do, Mr. Larkins? I mean, it was obsessive when he's like trying to hunt her down the street, but then it's like, if you can't find her, go hang out with her dad. Are the young ladies and all the family quite well? Seems so pointed that I blush. I think continually about my age. Say I'm 17, and say that 17 is young for the eldest Miss Larkins. What of that? Besides, I shall be one and 20 in almost no time. What? He's just suddenly jumped to 20 years old or 21 years old? Uh, uh, what? <laughs> what happened? I regularly take walks outside Mr. Larkin's house in the evening, though it cuts me to the heart to see the officers go in, or to hear them up in the drawing room where the eldest Miss Larkins plays the harp. I even walk, eh, on two or three occasions, in a sickly, spoony manner, round and round the house after the family are gone to bed. This is super creepy. Wondering which is the eldest Miss Larkin's chamber, and pitching, I dare say now, uh, Mr. Larkin's is instead, uh, wishing that a fire would burst out, and that the assembled crowd could stand appalled, that I, dashing through them with a ladder, might rear it against her window, save her in my arms, go back for something she had left behind, and, and perish in the flames, for I am generally disinterested in my love, and think that I could be content to make a figure before Miss Larkins and expire. Eh, generally, but not always. Sometimes brighter visions rise before me uh, when I dress the occupation of two hours, Jesus, uh, for, a, uh, for a great ball given at the Larkins, the anticipation of three weeks. I indulge my fancy with pleasing images. I picture myself eh, taking courage to make a declaration of Miss Larkins. Oh, I picture Miss Larkin sinking her head upon my shoulder and saying, Oh, Mr. Copperfield, can I, can I believe my ears? I 
picture Mr. Larkins waiting on me the next morning and saying, Oh, my dear Copperfield, my daughter has told me all. Youth is no objection. Here are 20,000 pounds. Uh, be happy! Exclamation point. I picture my aunt uh, relenting and blessing us. And Mr. Dick and Dr. Strong being present at the marriage ceremony. This is weird. His fantasies are insane. It's the equivalent of me daydreaming and also stalking someone and circling around their house at night, but uh, daydreaming that the, this person falls in love with me and then, like, my co-workers are at my wedding. It's just bizarre. I'm a sensible fellow, uh, I believe. I believe I'm looking back, I mean, and modest I am, sure. But all this goes on notwithstanding. I repair to the enchanted house where there are uh, lights, uh, chattering, uh, music, and flowers, officers, I'm sorry to see, and, and the eldest Miss Larkins, a blaze of beauty. Oh, she is dressed in blue, with blue flowers in her hair, for, uh, forget-me-nots, as if she had any need to wear forget-me-nots. It is the first really grown-up party that I've ever been invited to, and I'm a little uncomfortable, for I appear not to belong to anybody, and nobody appears to have anything to say to me, except, uh, oh, Mr. Larkins, who asked me how my schoolfellows are, which he needn't do, as I have not come there to be insulted. But after I've stood in the doorway for some time and feasted my eyes upon the goddess of my heart, she approaches me. She... The eldest, Miss Larkins, and asks me pleasantly if I dance. I stammer with a bow. With you, Miss Larkins. Eh, eh, no one else, inquires Miss Larkins. I should have no pleasure in dancing with anyone else. Eh, Miss Larkins laughs, blushes, or I think she blushes, and says, uh, next time uh, but one, I shall be very glad. Well, the time arrives... Uh, it's a waltz, I think, Miss Larkins uh, doubtfully observes when I present myself. Yeah, do, you, do you waltz? If not, Captain Bailey, I do waltz pretty well, too, as it happens. And I take Miss Larkins out. I take her sternly from the side of Captain Bailey. He is wretched, I have no doubt, but he is nothing to me. I have been wretched, too. I waltz. With the eldest Miss Larkins, exclamation point. I don't know where, among whom, or, or how long. I only know that I swim about in space with a, with, a, with a blue angel in a state of blissful delirium until I find myself alone with her yeah, in a little room, resting on a sofa. Oh, she admires a flower. Pink Camilla, uh, Camilla Japonica. Price half a crown. In my buttonhole. I give it to her and say... I ask an inestimable price for it, Miss Larkins. Uh, indeed, what is that? Returns Miss Larkins. A flower of yours that I may treasure as a, as a miser does gold. <laughs> That's not good visual imagery to give to her. That just is more creepiness. Oh, you're a bold boy, says Miss Larkins. There. Oh, she gives it to me, not displeased. And I, I put it to my lips and then to my breast. Miss Larkins, laughing, draws her hand through my arm and says, Now take me back to Captain Bailey. <laughs> well, he gets what he deserves for being a creepy, a creepy, lecherous person. I'm lost in the recollection of the delirious interview and the, and the waltz. When she comes to me again with a plain elderly gentleman who has been uh, playing whist all night upon her arm and says, Oh, uh, here is my bold friend. Uh, Mr. Chestel wants to know you, Mr. Copperfield. Yeah, because she probably said this creepy kid is getting all creepy and putting my flowers on his lips. And this guy's like, I want to go see that kid. I feel at once that he is a friend of the family and I am much gratified. I my taste, sir, says Mr. Chestel. It does you credit, I suppose. You don't take much interest in hops. But I am pretty large grower myself, and if you ever like to come over to our neighborhood, neighborhood of Ashford, and take a run about our place, we should be glad for you to stop as long as you like. I, I thank Mr. Chestel warmly and shake hands. I think I'm in a happy dream, really, because of Mr. Chestel. I waltz with the eldest Miss Larkins once again. She says I waltz so well. Oh, I go home in a state of unspeakable bliss and, and waltz in my imagination all night long with my arm around the blue waist of my dear divinity. Yeah, for some days afterwards, I'm, I'm lost in rapturous reflections, but I neither see her in the street nor when I call. 
I am perfectly consoled for this appointment uh, by the sacred pledge, the perished flower. Trotwood, says Agnes one day after dinner, uh, who do you think is going to get married tomorrow? Someone you admire. Uh, not you, I suppose, Agnes. Not me, raising a cheerful face from the music she is copying. Uh, do you hear him, Papa? Uh, the eldest Miss Larkins. To, to Captain Bailey? I have just enough power to ask. No, no, not to Captain. Uh, to Mr. Chestel, a hop grower, the old man. I am terribly dejected for about a week or two, and I take off my ring. And I wear my worst clothes. I use no bear's grease, and I frequently lament over the late Miss Larkin's faded flower, being by that time rather tired of this kind of life, and having received new provocation from the butcher, I throw the flower away, go out with the butcher, and gloriously defeat him. Oh, his love rage finally beat the bully. This and the resumption of my ring, as well as that of the bear's grease in moderation, are the last marks I can discern now in my progress to 17. So he's 17. <laughs> I thought he was 21. All right, whatever. Well, that was confusing. Uh, why don't we uh, retire to the smoking room where we can uh, peruse over what we've read and see what we've learned in this chapter. Uh, well, now that you're settled in here in the smoking room, uh, enjoy my, my Naugahyde chairs. I don't know if I'm even using the right word at this point. Uh, what do we learn in this chapter? Uh, well, David uh, does well in school. He becomes like a first boy. That's my cat. I let my cat down in the basement, which is a huge mistake because it's destroying everything. So he does well in school. He's the first boy. Uh, and so as first boy, he decides that he's going to uh, start getting in on the ladies in town. Uh, so he's uh, growing up. Uh, apparently he's 17, even though at one point I think he said he was like 21. I don't know. This enti that entire part was confusing. Uh, and so is Agnes, uh, the daughter of Mrs. Wickfield, Mr. Wickfield. Uh, David shares his romantic troubles with Agnes, and uh, she teases him, ha, about the temporary nature of his affections. Uh, David recounts uh, two crushes in particular. Uh, one, the local schoolgirl who briefly uh, returns his affection, like in a closet or something. They were in a, well, off in a room and they smooched. And then she blows him off. And the other is a much older woman, I think she's about 30, who flirts with David and then marries another man. Uh, a much older man, I think, if I read that correctly. What's good? Well, that David thinks he's got what it takes to get an older woman to like him. Good on him. That takes a level of confidence when you're, I think, 17. What sucks? Never knowing how old David is in this. Uh, plus the narrator, for some reason, just suddenly jumps into, like, his 70s or something. Like, some, this chapter starts out with him recounting his past, where we never had that at any point uh, reading up to now. Just suddenly the narrator is really old. We're not dealing with a narrator in real time anymore. Uh, well, what do we learn? Uh, his memories of attending school in Canterbury just kind of revolve around uh, chicks. Uh, it's a continuing theme in his life, I guess. We're going to hear about that a lot more in the next chapters. Uh, where his emotional world is kind of taken over by one woman or another. Like, whatever happened to the girl that lived in the boat... He's got to fall in love with her, right? Also, you got Agnes, who's right under his nose. If this is any kind of rom-com, it'd be him chasing after women, then finally, uh, towards the end, realizing, you were the one I loved all along. Now, I'm sure we'll find out. There's only 60 chapters left in this thing. Uh, the relationship between David and Agnes is developing uh, as he keeps going to her with all his problems, so it might mellow and amber into something wonderful. Well, with that, uh, thanks for listening, and I will uh, see you in the next episode. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most, where I tell you all about the places on the internet 
where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, there's there's that. Uh, I, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people, not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. You can see a backlog of everything I've ever read, uh, along with episodes from the Book Boys and uh, blah, blah, blah. You can also find me on Instagram, uh, which is a uh, house nuzzle. And conveniently enough, uh, Twitter, which is also at house nuzzle. Annoyingly, YouTube made me pick a name instead of just a house nuzzle. So I got Glenn Nuzzles. So I guess you search for that if you want to watch a screen that doesn't do anything and just hear my voice. Uh, and since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com. But don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's got to be one left.